listening to Play by Players, an MLSPA podcast. Now here's your host, former MLS player, Bobby Boswell. Hey everybody, thank you to another episode, uh, for joining us on another episode of Play by Players. We are joined today by one of my favorite central defenders to watch in MLS. He's played over 200 professional games across all competitions. He's played for the Vancouver Whitecaps. He's played for the New York Red Bulls. He's now with uh, my hometown team, the Houston Dynamo. He's also a member of the U.S. men's national team. Uh, Depending on if you're a a national team fan or a Red Bull fan, you say he's got fabulous red hair Uh, here in Houston. We say he's got beautiful orange Houston Dynamo hair. Um, personally, I feel like he's got the, uh, the best quad muscles in, in MLS, yeah. uh, maybe in the history of the league with the exception of Hamasen Olave. Uh, but for those of you that don't know from that intro, uh, please welcome to the podcast, Tim Parker. What's up, Bobby? Uh, thank you for having me on. And, uh, those are quite the compliments. I'm going to, I'm going to run with those. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if I had legs like yours, I, I, you know, I would, Mike Chabala is an old teammate of mine. He wears short shorts. I would wear the Mike Chabala shorts all the time and show those bad boys off. I'm, I'm not kidding. I just talked to uh, Eddie, our equipment guy here at Houston. And I was like, Eddie, I think I'm going to need some shorter shorts for the summertime. Well, there you go. Bring it, bring them out, man. The sun's out, the, you know, sun's out, guns out skies. I don't know. What's the, what's the other <laughs> one? Something, I mean, guys for the guys. Yeah, I'm going to have to be real careful because, uh, I mean, these thighs don't really get to see too much sun. So I'm going to need some serious sunscreen on those. Absolutely. Well, um, let's, you know, you kind of hinted uh, before we uh, we got going here. I know you mentioned uh, comparing your legs to Saquon. Uh, you're a guy from from New York. Um, you know, actually, the, the town you're from is Hicksville. Uh, is it Hicksville, USA? Can we call it? Yeah, yeah, we can call it that. That's completely fine. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's funny is I'm from Florida and people think I'm a hick uh, and now I live in Texas and they think uh, Texans are a bunch of, of, of hicks. So it's kind of funny that a guy from from, you know, not too far from New York and Manhattan is uh, is it's Hicksville, New York. I, w- I was going to say, if it was like from an upstate part of New York or like way out east on Long Island, then like it would be somewhat acceptable. But. I mean, it's really not even that far outside of um, Manhattan. It's only like 25 miles out. So it's kind of a weird name for a town, but uh, it's, it, it was good to me when I was growing up for sure. Well, well tell me, how, how does a guy from, you know, really Manhattan, you know, go to become uh, a professional soccer player? I know that it's a big basketball area, uh, New York, especially the city, but how does, how does one find time to, or even a field to play soccer in, in New York? Yeah, I think um, for me, when I was when I was a kid, soccer is like the first sport that you can actually play like when you're when you're super young. So I think that that was the first thing that my parents signed me and my brother up for. So my brother's 18 months older than me. So it was kind of like when he signed up, I just got signed up as well and kind of thrown into the ring. Um, And I think that was kind of the first thing that kind of came of it. And then we just kept playing it. We kind of fell in love with it. And kept playing and none of my, my, my family's not really a soccer family. So that's, that's even the better part of the whole thing is they, my dad has come to learn the rules and so has my mom, but um, for a long time, it was, it was a real stretch and what they knew and what they didn't. Well, listen, my dad was from Jackson, Mississippi. So I, uh, I understand that. And I, I don't think he still knew all the rules when, uh, before he left. So <laughs> um, talk, talk to me a little bit about, um, about your high school experience. I, I always focus on guys' high schools. My favorite thing to do is to check and see if, if you're listed as one of their, uh, one of their celebrity or f- famous people. Uh, you are. There's I made another, it. I there's, made another, it. <laughs> there's another pretty big one on there that most people uh, will know. Who, who else went to your, uh, your high school? Ah, uh, Billy Joel. Piano Billy man. Joel. But yeah, you know, you know, what's really weird is um, Hicksville is actually orange, black, and white. They're like the Hicksville Comets is their uh, the high school mascot. So I'm not kidding. Comet, Comet the dog. <laughs> yeah. If, if you go back to my high school pictures, I'm in an all orange jersey or an all black jersey. And it looks just like the like Dynamo kit. So like my friends, when I obviously got traded down to Houston, were like, we've been orange. We were never red. And it's just like, 
<laughs> you know, it's just like your friends from home, just like the constant, the constant rivalry. Oh, no, that sounds awesome. Uh, it's like match made in heaven. It sounds like being, I don't know if people would consider Houston heaven, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll take it. We'll take it. Um, before we get into the too much MLS, uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about um, where you're from. I understand you were, you know, I, I saw that you liked lacrosse and you played a little bit. I would imagine just based on your athleticism that you are an absolute tank uh, in lacrosse. Yeah, I mean, Long Island is like the hotbed for lacrosse, you know, and I think um, I got into lacrosse because all my best friends were kind of lax guys growing up, lax pros, right? So um, it was a way for me to stay like fit in the off season. And then uh, as I got older, I got like more serious about it. Um, being on Long Island, it's a, it's, I don't want to say an easy way to get to college, but because Long Island lacrosse is so good compared to other places, a lot of recruiting comes to Long Island to get guys to go to school. So um, I actually had the opportunity. One Lacrosse was one of the first reasons why I went to go visit schools because of um, their recruiting starts a year earlier than soccer. So I got to visit a couple of cool schools through lacrosse and then, uh, but I, you know, so soccer had my heart at that time. So I was waiting to hear all my soccer stuff. So did you, did you just go on them to get a, get a free, free night out in, in some of the places or, or were you just still too young then to even know how to take advantage of that? No, I, the first, so the first visit I went on and it, I, I still, I tell everyone this story just cause it, it ruined my like entire expectations of college <laughs> was like the first one I went on, I went to uh, UNC, I went to Chapel Hill. And the first thing me and my dad, like me and my dad fly down there and we go to like a, be a football game and then we're, we stay the weekend and me and my dad are walking around. We're like, the facilities here are like insane. And then like, you're walking around like, yeah, we, I end up going out with the lacrosse team that night. A guy from my high school is actually on the lacrosse team. So it was like, I had a friend there kind of immediately. And um, like, it was a really cool experience, but like that just set the bar so high for every other like college visit that I was like, I can't actually hold other colleges to that standard. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You, did you get, I'm just curious, I, we're getting to your college in a second, but did you get recruited to play soccer there or were they too, too snobby at that point? Yeah, they, they were a little bit too snobby for me at that point, okay. but um, that, that, would have been, that would have been a really cool combo school to do it at. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we, we were talking a little bit about high school. Um, I, I looked up your stats. Uh, you were quite a goal scoring machine in high school where I, I mean, is, is, is high school soccer in Long Island, like where I'm from, I had great stats, but we were like the worst team and terrible. So it wasn't that hard to, you know, you, I'd score two goals, but we'd lose six to two. Um, you know, what was, what was high school soccer like? And did you play defense? It sounds like you didn't. No, I never, I usually played like like a six or and then like my senior year I decided to play forward just because I <laughs> just because I wanted to I guess um and it was I mean it was a lot of fun like you I mean for me it was like the opportunity to play in front of my friends and like I said a lot of them were like football guys and lacrosse guys so they like would come to the games and just like scream the whole time so like I, I didn't want to be playing defense and like listening to them I wanted to be like you know, getting on the ball and doing, doing the cool stuff, scoring goals and, you know, the, the fun stuff that we don't really get to do. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I have the same, my friends, even today, they're, they're texting me that they're going to join the super league teams because they're, <laughs> they're good enough at 40 to like, Oh, we think we're going to come and just go play that for a little while to be a part of it. They, they don't even understand soccer, but uh, it's awesome. Sounds like we had similar, uh, similar backgrounds. Yeah. I was going to um, say. Well, you, you did pretty well, apparently, playing forward because you were uh, you were New York Gatorade Player of the Year. You joined the likes of uh, uh, Miles Joseph, John Bush, Dima Kovalenko. And uh, I don't know if you played. Do you play with Mike Grella in New York? No, I never played with him, but I know, obviously, Grella just from being around. OK, so, yeah, you joined this this list. Uh, there's there's a lot of names on there that maybe I should know that I don't. But um you know, pretty good company there. Tell me what it was, you know, at that point, did it justify, you know, giving up lacrosse to, to play soccer or, or what were you thinking? Yeah, yeah, it definitely did. You know, I think I went into that senior year. Um, I had already com committed to go to St. John's, which was in New York. And um, I just wanted to have fun with it. 
my senior year. We had a coach that like just became our varsity head coach at the time. So we were kind of helping, helping him run the team while also trying to win and be successful. Um, so, and to be fair, uh, Long Island soccer, I think is good. It's not as good as maybe in other places. So the stats might be a little bit inflated, but um, I'll be honest as well. Some of the goals I scored that year, like I was just hot. I was just, I was just hot. It was, it was, it was give me the rock, you know? You were feeling it. <laughs> I mean, we're talking bombs or are you talking about dribbling through guys that are both? No, it was just, it was just shooting. It was just, you, I, you know, I'm not a dribbler, Bobby. Come on. <laughs> I don't know. You know, in high school, I, they thought I had good feet. So that gives you an idea of what my <laughs> experience was like. Um, all right. Well, you kind of, you kind of joked around and said Long Island isn't uh, that big of a, a, a hotbed, but uh, talk to me. I think I might be getting ahead of St. John's here, but um, talk to me about the Long Island Rough Riders. Um, you know, that, that team, you know, I talk about, some of the guys that got Gatorade player of the year uh, for anyone that wants to go see who's who in New York soccer, go look up the list of names of people that have played for the long Island rough riders over the last 30 years. Uh, tell me about that experience. Yeah. I think the rough riders were, were one of like the first professional teams like in long Island or semi-professional, whatever, whatever you kind of wanted to call it. So that was like the, the bar when I was a kid, we would go to those games and like my trainer at the time played for the Rough Riders. Um, and once you became of eight, once you were kind of on that high school college, like boundary, you could, you could try out for the team or you got asked to play for them. And like you said, there was like a who's who of players that had played for them, alumni, like guys that moved on from the Rough Riders. So it was kind of, uh, the team to play for when you're that younger New York kind of age group that is trying to play in the summertime. Yeah. And, and um, like I said, a couple of guys are now coaches, Giovanni Savarese. Uh, you've got, I know Wilmer, Wilmer Cabrera was there, Chris Armis. Yeah. Um, you know, guys you played with uh, in the league as well. So it's a, it's a really impressive list. I went through it and I was trying to take notes and I'm just like, I don't have, I can't go through all these guys. It'll be half, <laughs> half the podcast, but um, you know, and then you also played for the Brooklyn Italians. Is that, I mean, that's like, you know, for the U S U S uh, open cup history uh, historian fans, uh, if those people do exist, I don't know, but uh, there's some pretty cool stats there with that team uh, coming up and winning it a couple of times. You, you got to play with them as well. Yeah, I, I definitely don't fit into the normal Italian mold, but um, it, it was a really, really cool experience. Uh, it was one of those things where I was, when I was in college, I was training with the Cosmos and I needed a team to get games. And we had a really good relationship with the Italians. So I was able to, because they were so close to St. John's, I was able to get games in with them. And uh, when, when you talk about like people, um, from like the organization, I mean, they, they do talk about the open cup, you know, they have that like old school clubhouse in Brooklyn where like there's guys sitting outside that are like 80 years old that still talk about like their days as the Italians. So there's a lot of history to that club. Yeah, no, I, I thought that was really cool. I encourage listeners that love the game to go take a look at their story. You can find that pretty easily. Um, I think it was awesome that you got to be a part of that. I love that when you talk about it, it sounds like we're talking about uh, like an Italian mafia, like, you know, <laughs> sitting outside the old, the old guard and, and, and this and that, but um, let's get back to, back to your story with, with, you know, you talk about St. John's. It's a very uh, historic school for soccer. Um, I'm wearing my, I got a New York, uh, I got my never forget shirt on, but um, I, fl I flew in and played St. John's a week after nine 11. We were like one of the first flights that was allowed in. And uh, I'm pretty sure we lost, we lost both games, <laughs> um, but St. John's, that was when Chris Winger, I think was there. And, um, you know, they're just a historical powerhouse, or at least, you know, they have been in the past, uh, you know, talk to me about going to college there and playing soccer. Yeah. I think the, the reason I went to school there was because of coach Mazer and how much success he had and still continues to have, um, and how well he, how well he did at developing center backs. So that was, that was the reason why I decided to go there was, he had an incredible resume for producing center backs that went on to play at the pro level. And 
for me, that was like the end all be all. I was like, look, dad, if I like, if I don't go pro, at least like I went to school close to Manhattan and I can go and work in Manhattan, but like, at least the ball there's, there's a path that I can take to get to that pro level. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And, and you had some success there. Y'all were Big East champs while you were there. I know you were, uh, you were a captain. Um, you know, you're, you know, I know your story more than, more than most probably. I know your role behind the scenes, um, you know, with the PA now. And, um, you know, talk to me a little bit about, this is kind of the first, I, I think you were a captain in high school, but that, that doesn't carry a lot of weight in a lot of people's books. Um, but, you know, you were a captain in college and, and talk to me a little bit about, you know, starting to become a leader at a, at a young age. Yeah, I think um, when I was younger, I, I always kind of had a, a little bit more of a presence. So I think I was I was looked up upon to have that kind of leadership role. And when I even even when I was at St. John's, you know, when I was an underclassman, I kind of still had a little bit more on my shoulders to kind of carry. And I I embraced that, you know, I embraced guys that kind of looking to me for answers or looking to me for advice and um, not to say that I had all the answers, but to help so like problem solve and to help figure things out along the way, I think was something that I, that I enjoy doing. And when guys are able to look at you with, you know, when they look at you for that leadership and then when they look at you to have their back and whatever aspect that it is, it's, it's a pretty rewarding feeling. No, oh, that's, that's great. Um, you know, and, and, and I think those are some of the qualities that, uh, helped when the pros were, were evaluating you. Uh, I know you get you get drafted in the first round. You're the first St. John's guy to get drafted in the first round, which I thought that was incredible. Just uh, I couldn't believe other guys. Not not to say that you didn't deserve that. I just couldn't believe other guys hadn't been drafted in the first round. So that's a pretty big honor. Uh, you get taken 13th overall by Carl Robinson to Vancouver. Um, I, I've got to think a guy from, you know, New York City is is pumped that he's going to the league. But at the same time, you get drafted to Vancouver and you're like, that's great. <laughs> Where the hell is Vancouver? Yeah, I mean, to to start that off, like it was kind of a running joke with all my buddies. When, when I was in college, they were like, oh, you're going to you're going to go play soccer in Canada. And I was like, no, like, come on, <laughs> like, don't don't put that on me. Like, I want to stay in the States. And then. Of course, like fate has it that, um, you know, I, I made an impression on Carl Robinson and his staff and I get drafted out to Vancouver. And I mean, whenever they when they say your name and whatnot, it's all like blackout. Right. Like you're so happy. Um, and But I remember my dad afterwards, I go and say my dad, like talk to my dad and my dad's like, you realize that's the farthest city you could have possibly gone to. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't, I didn't choose that, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, and granted for the, for everyone listening, Vancouver is an amazing city and organization. I have nothing but good things to say about that place. But to say at first, my experience there wasn't, wasn't all that I thought it was going to be. It was a little bit down at first. Okay. Well, what do you, I mean, do you want to, do you want to get into that or, or, or? Yeah, yeah. I got no problem. I think the whole north the northwestern part of like the u.s right like seattle portland vancouver like when i moved out there in january i was like okay i'm i'm really excited to be here like this is that like i get the tour around the city and i think the city is beautiful but then it is just gray and rainy for like two whole months while i'm there and i'm like is this really what this place is like like at least in New York, if it's like, and it was never really that cold, but at least if it was in New York, like it could be 30 degrees outside, but the sun could be shining in Vancouver. It's like 40 degrees and raining just consistently. It's hard to maintain your tan. Is what yeah, you're yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, for those that don't know, I mean, Vancouver was one of my favorite places to play. Now, granted, I, I think every time I ever went there, it was like the middle of summer and we would fly in early and like go down by the water. And it was just incredible, you know, go watch the airplanes land on the water and uh, people are like riding their bikes. It's like the home of Lululemon. So there's like 
beautiful women walking around in like yoga pants, like as a young guy, that's just like, <laughs> I was like, this is the greatest city ever. Um, and the teams, you know, before you got there, they were very good. So we usually had a pretty good, uh, a pretty good road trip, but, um, you know, talk to me a little bit about, I mean, the, 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 the teams while you were there, you won a Canadian championship. Um, y'all had some success in champions league. Uh, you had, you know, a, a theme with you is you, you had, uh, one of the best goals against records, uh, one of the best defenses in the league, uh, for one of the years you were there. Um, you know, talk to me a little bit about the, the soccer side of it and, and, you know, playing for, for the two coaches you had while you were there. Yeah. So when, uh, while I was there, my first year, I kind of got walked into a locker room with like a bunch of good center backs. You know, I kind of walked into the locker room with Kendall Waston, who had just got, who had been there pretty recently. Um, pa Muruka, who had been in the league a long time. And I was kind of the new guy walking into the locker room. And I don't think that Carl or Robo expected me to step in and play necessarily that first year. But they definitely had Pa there to kind of teach me, mentor me, you know, and everyone I tell this to, I think Pa, pa has a, a great rep of being a great guy. Um, he's, he's a vicious player, I'll be honest. He, he can throw a tackle, but he, um, he really did mentor me in like the best way. You know, he, he took me under his wing. We did video together. We did a lot of stuff together. Um, he would take me out to dinner. You know, he would make sure I was comfortable. And overall, he was a he was a big part of my development when I was in Vancouver. And I think uh, I give him a lot of credit for the way he was when I when I first got there. Yeah, he's he's I'd say, you know, you talk about the tackles, but I always felt like he was the guy that would kick you and then help you up. Like he was just a good dude um, and he still is and he's still making an impact in, in his coaching. So um, and then I'm a big I, I, Kendall was with uh, the Dynamo when he was like 16. And he was like skinnier than I was. Um, so I know I've known Kendall forever and I love Kendall and I, I will only root against Costa Rica if he's not playing uh, yeah. for them. But, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about uh, champions league uh, just going through your, your career. You've, you've played a ton of uh, champions league minutes. It's kind of uh, it's kind of pretty cool on some level. I, I personally hate Champions League when I played in it. I think it's gotten better for the accommodations, um, but it's it's not really a tournament I feel that sets MLS up for much success with the timing. Um, you know, as someone that's gotten pretty far in that tournament and, you know, you've played some, some of the big Mexican powerhouses to be eliminated, um, you know, looking at what's going on now with MLS clubs, do you feel like do you feel like we're about to turn a corner here or do you think it's going to be, you know, they still have that, that level that they can kind of just turn it up a little bit and they're going to, they're going to continue their success. You know, I think the MLS clubs definitely have started to turn the page a little bit. I think, um, you know, I, I've gotten to play against like Chivas and Monterey and, and, and all the, and Tigres and Santos. I think yeah, played. I've got to play against Santos. So um, I've gotten to play against a lot of big Mexican clubs and, the experiences of going to Mexico and playing in those stadiums is something that I think the MLS players need to keep getting because the environments there are something that you can learn from. Like you learn something right away when you step into those stadiums. Like when we played against Tijuana, um, I mean, you learn right away that you're like, you're in for it that game, you know, the whole 90 minutes. Um, and I, I watched a bunch of the Champions League this year and, you know, it just seems that, ML, the MLS teams are starting to learn how to handle the games. You know, I think we're actually starting to learn how to not, not just develop, but just in terms of managing, you know, like managing the game, how to rotate the players, the players know like their roles when they come in. And I think the, the big question is, is going to be who can, I mean, T grace just always seems to have, have, have the number in champions league. So I'm hoping someone can top them this year. Yeah. No, I, it's like I'm. I'm so happy that everyone, you know, did so well early on. But who knows? Uh, you still, you still got to go through the big boys to get there. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's move on. So you you uh, you know you do your three years. That's like kind of your time, right? You do three and and then you move on. Uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, getting finding. How did you find out that you were going back to New York? Um, so when I was in Vancouver, it was one of those things where. Um, 
I was, I was trying to, I was at towards the end of my contract. So I was trying to find a way to get some leverage in terms of like, look, like I, I wanted to stay in Vancouver initially and then it didn't work out. And I ended up asking to be traded because of contracts reasons. But so I ended up getting, and uh, to, to Robo's credit, Robo was awesome throughout the whole process. You know, he was, he was really, really kind about it and he understood where I was coming from. And then he told me that New York happened to be interested. And I was like, well, Robo, like if that happens to be on the plate, like, you know, I, I would love to play, play at home. And uh, it worked out um, that I ended up going back to Red Bull and uh, that's, that's kind of where, where my next step was. And that's, that's actually when I went down to Tijuana. So like I got traded and like the next like three days I was on a plane to Tijuana to meet the team in like the Tijuana airport. And this is like a great story in itself because the Red Bull flight got delayed. So I was just sitting in Tijuana airport for like three hours by myself waiting for Red Bull to land. <laughs> There's nothing bad that could happen to you in Tijuana, you know, like just yeah, have, no, a couple, I mean, have a couple of margaritas. <laughs> I completely belong down there. I fit in perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, tell me about, you know, your dad gave you a hard time about going to uh, Vancouver. I mean, they had to be your family. And then especially, um, you know, it sounds like you've got a really close group of friends. I mean, everyone had to be pumped that you were you were coming back to the East Coast. Yeah, they were really excited. You know, I think my my dad, my mom and dad obviously immediately were like, OK, we got to get season tickets. Like, how many do we get? Do you expect like your friends to be coming to games with us? My dad is like a big uh he, he's a big tailgating guy so he's like look should I start organizing like buses to games from Hicksville and I was like dad like don't get ahead of yourself here you're gonna like create my friends like this is gonna be a bad Red Bull games are gonna turn into a, a bad way for my friends um but yeah you know they were really really excited and then most of my family still lives in New York like my uncles and aunts and cousins so um being being around for the games was great to have them at games, but then also to be around for like family parties and birthdays and all those kind of holidays was uh, also really, really, really nice. Yeah. And it's important that guys have an outlet outside of the team. And I think it's hard when you're a new guy in a new city. I mean, heck you're in a new country, um, you know, then to be able to say, Hey guys, I'm, I'm going to go out with this other, I'm going to get, I'm going to get away from the game today, especially if you have friends that, that don't like soccer and they don't want really <laughs> to talk about it. it. It's a good release. And I, I think that's important that um, everybody have some, something like that out of work or, you know, I call it work. It's, it's really a game, but you know, it's, it's important to be able to get away from it. Um, you know, what, what are your, I, I know as a, I call it like the, the Hampton Montauk, you know, like, <laughs> like, you guys in Long Island, you just, you, you know, you've got this different attitude about life. I went to college with some guys from that area and they just have like a, a I don't know how to explain it. It's like a California vibe, but in from New York with like a, a bit more of an attitude. Would you yeah, say that? A, a little bit tougher attitude to it. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, you know, you're not like burn bomb, you know, you're like a tough guy. <laughs> yeah. I think um, it, it's, it's cool. You know, I think when I first came back to New York, I actually lived with two of my, a buddy from college. So like, that was kind of like an instant, like separation from like soccer to like going back to my roommate and we were able to kind of separate the two right away. And then, yeah, you know, I, I think um, if you talk to anyone from Long Island, all they talk about is like the beaches and Jones beach and fire Island and the Hamptons uh, unfortunately, I didn't really get to go out to the Hamptons that much as a, as a kid or, or even like as a young adult, just cause, you know, being in season, the Hamptons is like a two and a half hour ride outside of the city. So if you really wanted to go out there, you'd have, you need the, you need the plan and the, the willingness, okay. the will, yeah. the will to go. Um, okay. so I, I never really, I never really got out there. I got out there one time, um, to uh to this place called Bordy Barn and that's that's a place that can go down that's a Long Island like staple so you could look okay. that up afterwards well I'll uh I'll tell you a little bit about my I went to the Hamptons once it was for a modeling shoot but it, <laughs> but that has nothing uh in comparison to your fashion week stuff but we'll get to that uh in a little bit I want to talk about the Red Bulls uh you know you you had success in uh, in Vancouver, you come into the Red Bulls, the expectations, I think, were probably a lot different there. And 
and you were able to produce uh, some hardware right away. Talk to me about playing for Jesse and then uh, maybe even playing for Chris a little bit. Yeah, I mean, playing for Jesse was very intense. You know, I think everyone that everyone that plays for Jesse understands or has some kind of way to, to, to describe his coaching style. And it's, it's intense. He'll yell at you if you're the first roster player, or the last roster player, and he, he demands what he wants. And if it, if it's not that, then you'll kind of, you'll figure that out really quickly. But yeah, I mean, when I first got to Red Bull, it was, it was me and Aaron Long and this is like Aaron Long's first season. And that ended up being his like breakout year. And uh, so they paired me with Aaron and I was, we were able to, we got along pretty, pretty well right away, which was a good, which was a good thing. And um, yeah, we, you know, we kind of just hit the ground running that year in 2018 and we never really hit, hit a dip or hit, hit a pothole, you know, like we were kind of consistently, like every time we played a game, we knew that if, even if we were down, we, we still had a chance. And, if we were up, then we knew we weren't going to concede a goal. We just had like a really good energy about us and, and everything. And then obviously Jesse leaves like mid summer to go to Austria, to go to Austria, to go to Salzburg. And he's like, he was devastated when he had to leave. He was, he was really upset about it. And Chris obviously ends up taking over. And if you know anything about Chris, like he's an amazing guy. I've known Chris a long time, obviously just cause he's from Long Island. So him being my he was a coach for me when I was like 16 and then to go full circle and he was a coach for me in the pros was really really cool um and he was he was the assistant coach at everyone you know Chris Chris enjoyed playing like playing uh horseshoes after training and talking a lot of crap to you if you if he beat you and he he usually did because Chris Chris is really technical you know he's good so his transition to the to the head coaching role was pretty seamless in terms of everyone knew what they were getting out of him. And then he has this energy and aura about him that like, you know, he's got a lot, a lot of energy. So once once he stepped into that role and we were able to figure things out and obviously continue to have a successful 2018, it was it was a really, really good year. Yeah. And like I said, you guys, uh, I think Supporter Shield, I think 71 points, which is a pretty impressive number for those that that follow MLS, they know that's really hard to get to, um, you know, and then kind of over the course of your career, not to, uh, I'm not trying to talk trash or anything. You've just had, I, I've, I've had a lot of bad luck with uh, playing good teams in the playoffs. I, you know, Michael Parkhurst is another guy. Uh, when you talk about center backs, you, your career is interesting in that uh, uh, a lot of the times in the playoffs, you guys, uh, the teams you lose to go on to win MLS cup, which, I don't mean that as a bad thing. I think that if you're going to lose to a team, um, you know, you never want it to be your rival, but you do want them to at least go on and do something. So you say, well, we're, you know, we were, we were outclassed on the day by the champions. Yeah. It's, it's happened to me four times. It's happened to me against Portland, Seattle, Atlanta, and Columbus. Columbus. Yeah. 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 I saw that. I thought that was interesting. And I, I know that feeling and it sucks. Um, but I, I think that's a testament to you too, though. Right. It's like, you're, at least you're there. And, and you're, in, you're in those games. And um, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the, the Red Bulls, you know, as a DC United player for so long, we had this rivalry with, with the Red Bulls, you know, started back when they were the Metro stars. Um, that's how old I was. Um, but, but New York, you know, they have like seven, I, I think every team's the Red Bulls rival now, because it's like they've got a team in New York and then Philadelphia, they added Philly and DC still there. And then you've got, New England and then Chicago was good back in the day. So that's a good one. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that rivalry. Like what's it, what's it like to play there? And then, you know, kind of compare it to Vancouver where you've got this Cascadia um, rivalry with, with Seattle and Portland, where really that's more about the atmosphere, less about the game. It, it, and, you know, talk to talk a little bit about the differences there. Cause not many people have been a part of both of those. Yeah, so I think definitely the New York DC rivalry has more of the history of terms of going all the way back to like when the league started and all the players that have all the amazing players that have played for both clubs that have had, you know, a mark on the league and a mark on that rivalry and they've created just a running tension between the clubs, 
you know, and I think that that is something that continues to build. I, Red Bull still talks about it. Like every time we play DC, there's, it's more than just the, more than just the game. It's more than just the trip. Um, you're playing for like the guys that used to play in it years ago and stuff. And I think that that's, that's a really cool aspect to it because there's that history behind it where when you, when you flip the switch and you look at Vancouver and the Cascadia cup and stuff like that, um, to me, when I was in Vancouver, it seemed more like, more like you said, for the atmosphere, more for the supporters in terms of, because Vancouver is, it's just the Whitecaps and the Canucks. And then you look at Portland and it's just them. It's just the Timbers and the Trailblazers. So soccer is a big part of these, these cities where like, they take a lot of pride in going to the games, making the atmosphere what they make it. So when you're able to I, I never actually won the Cascadia Cup, but when you're able to get results against other Cascadia teams, it's like a, it's legit a bragging right for, for until the next time you guys face off. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I, I love playing in uh, Vancouver because they, you know, have a huge stadium. Seattle's, you know, when they pack that thing, it's awesome. And then Portland's just its own. Like I say, you can't explain Portland to anybody. They just have to go. And, um, you know, that's what I tell bucket listers I say hey, if you get a chance go up and if I had to send them to one one place I would probably send them to to Seattle or, or you know for a full game you know maybe a, a Portland game or something along those lines but um all right well so you're 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 in New York you have some success you do your you do your three-year stints um <laughs> you know you you play with uh you know some more great players there um and then you find out you're getting traded to uh, the hottest place in MLS. And I don't, I don't necessarily mean that as, as a good thing. Uh, talk to me a little bit about finding out about Houston. Yeah. So I was, um, I was in Florida for the off season. My girlfriend, uh, her family lives down there. So um, being that a, a lot of New York was closed and cold and cold, we were like, let's go down to Florida and, visit and see her family for a while. And I kind of just woke up one morning to a call from the Red Bull GM that I was going to get that I was getting traded. And it honestly hit me as a shock just because, you know, I didn't know much about it leading up to that. So um, yeah, it was, it was just a call from Red Bull saying that I got traded. And then the next phone call was with Matt Jordan and Tab. And uh, you know, I think it was, it was reassuring when I got on the phone with Matt and Tab because they were really excited and it gave me reassurance as a player, because sometimes when you're traded or you leave a team and you go somewhere else, you don't know how, how much that other team wants you or if it was just your your ex club trying to just get rid of you so for me it was actually a good situation which houston was trying to get me and um that kind of made my excitement grow real quick real fast yeah and then talk to me a little bit um you know you, you play you talked about kendall and, and, and pa and then you play with aaron long um you know talk to me about how your role is a little different here i think the expectations are, you know, one, we've talked about some of your success, your hardware, um, but now you're, you're kind of expected to bring, you know, you've mentioned the word accountability. That's my favorite word uh, with sports and with life. Um, you know, what's your, what's your leadership role? And do you look at this as an opportunity to kind of write your, you know, write your own legacy, you know, having a, a team that maybe wasn't that successful in the last couple of years where you can be the, maybe the catalyst to help you know, bring them along. Yeah. Um, 100%. You know, I think it's actually kind of like a running joke with my friends that like, I'm kind of like the perfect, like Robin, because when I played with Kendall, Kendall won defender of the year. And then I played with Aaron and Aaron run defender of the year. And, you know, I, I didn't really get to touch on Kendall that much, but I mean, he's, he, he means everything to me. You know, he's a big teddy bear for everyone that's afraid of him. He's just, he's a moving refrigerator. That's the best way I like to explain him. <laughs> But um, yeah, now, now being in Houston, um, you know, I'm, I'm older now and I'm more experienced. And I think the reason they brought me down here was, was for a couple of those things was to add a little bit of stability to the back line, um, rely on me a lot to, to, to lead and to be a voice. And I think I have a little bit of like an old school defender mentality and pedigree and I think that that's something that they were looking to bring down here. And I think that that obviously fits me perfectly because that's kind of what I pride myself on being about. So um, 
that's something that I wanted to bring down here. And it's, it's a little difficult when you go to a new team to be who you are right away and to bring that attitude and that kind of competitiveness. But now I'm, I'm 28, so I don't really have like a full, a year to a year to get used to the team and then integrate myself. I kind of have to do it right away and, and put my foot on the gas right away. So I think that's something that I've been trying to do right away this year. Yeah, no, I, I was excited when I, I heard we were getting you just one, I'm a big fan, but two, you know, I think, I think you can really help the team. And, um, you know, I don't, I try not to have any bias on this podcast, so I won't go any further than that, <laughs> but um, let's talk a little bit about the national team. You, you've got, you know, I mentioned you had some, uh, I think you had some experience with the youth, uh, the youth teams, um, but you've got a couple caps. You, uh, you're one of those guys, you know, with defenders, people don't realize they get called into a lot of camps before they, they, uh, they actually get to play in some of the games. So um, talk to me a little bit about that experience. And, you know, I think if you, you have a great year and you lead the Dynamo to the playoffs and things like that, you're, you're right, right in the mix again. Um, you know, what are your, what are your hopes and, and dreams with that? Yeah, I, I, I was really lucky when I was a kid to obviously be included in the youth national teams and gain that experience and that, that honor of, you know, putting on that the first time you put on the, one of those shirts that has the USA crest on it, you know? And I think as you get older, it, 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 the competition gets harder, but you want it more and more. And then when I came into the league, um, this is back when Jurgen was the coach. Uh, I got called in to do a, a couple of, a couple of camps while he was, while he was running the team. And, it was a lot of experience for me, kind of like, it was a lot of experience for me. I didn't really necessarily go into the camps thinking I was going to play, but going into those camps and like learning from the guys that were there and trying to pick, like pick their brains and stuff like that was, was really important for me. And then, yeah, I ended up getting two camps or two, two games in, in 2018 when I, when I came first came to the Red Bull. And I mean, that was like the ultimate, you know, I think when, when you finally get that, that cap after being into so many camps, it's, it's so rewarding, but I, I say this to so many people also that once you get one, it's like, wow, I finally did it. How many more can I get? You know? So obviously I'm still in that process of trying to get my next one, trying to get called back in. And I'm really hoping that this year and the way I'm going to try to play and build myself and um, progress this year is going to, is going to result in that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's awesome. And I, I'm a big fan of talking about it, talking it into existence. So uh, we're, we're putting that out there in the world. And now uh, hopefully it gets fulfilled. Um, let's talk a little bit about off the field. I kind of hinted at my, I joked about uh, my modeling career in New York. Um, you know, we, I don't think we've ever had anyone on the podcast who's uh, been a, been a male model uh, in fashion week, you know, uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the, I want to talk about that one. Uh, and then just really, I want to know uh, some of the stuff that people maybe don't know about you that that you're proud of for your off the field stuff, because I, I think you pride yourself on having a, a good social life. Um, you're not just a soccer player. Um, you live your life. And I kind of want to know, you know, outside of the male modeling, what else you uh, what else you're proud of over the, the career you've had so far? Yeah, I think uh, the male modeling was something that was completely underplayed to me and Sean Davis when we did it you know it was like oh do you guys want to walk out a fashion week thing and we were like yeah that would be really cool not knowing that like Susanna like Susanna is setting us up in like this like actual catwalk like runway where like me and Sean are like looking out like behind the curtain we're like dude there's like a hundred people out there easy on that runway and uh, it was it was really, really cool. It was really cool, but probably one of the most nervous moments of my life. Were, were you more nervous about your footwork then than any other time you've ever played? Yeah, yeah. Apart from probably being like 1v1 with Giovinco, like that was <laughs> the most nervous my feet could have been. <laughs> All right. Well, what, what else what else is is Tim Parker proud of uh, you know I don't want to I don't want to say the things that I think are cool but I have no problem saying them I just <laughs> what 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 else are you um, what other cool opportunities um, ha have you had that that you know your friends you know I always say 
the stuff that your friends make fun of you about, you know, that they're jealous of secretly, uh, what do you have that they, that they don't, uh, that they haven't been able to experience and they're mad that, that the soccer guy from Long Island was able to achieve? Oh man, that's, that's tough. Uh, you know, I used to get a lot of stick back at Red Bull because I was like, I was like a social butterfly, like networking kind of guy. I enjoyed like when I was back in New York, like meeting one guy and going to like grabbing coffee or a beer with someone that I didn't really know and trying to like just network myself around around New York because I thought that making connections and I, I still obviously I feel that way now that I'm in Houston too and I've felt that way for a long time that when when you're able to meet some when you're able to meet people and have conversations with people apart from soccer and outside of the soccer world it it means a lot more to, to you and to them. So I think that I pride myself on doing that a lot. I, I enjoy conversations with random people, uh, regardless of what it could be. And then, um, you know, I, I try to, I try to get involved in little things. You know, I think I, I got involved in common goal a couple of years ago, um, which is a charity run by Juan Mata. And, uh, I think that it's a really, really, really cool dynamic in terms of, they, they reach out to a bunch of soccer players all across the world and they, it's a commitment to growing, growing the game and to growing the game outside of, uh, outside of the normal areas. So I think that's a really cool foundation that I'm a part of and I'm really proud to be a part of that as well. I love the, the diplomatic answer. We, I always say at the end, we'll, we'll talk charity, but you you worked it in. I, I, was it thinking, early. I was thinking more like, you know, not many people can say they've been on the can of a of a drink. Um, yeah. oh, I was saying yeah. maybe your friends are jealous that you get to go to golf tournaments and interview people and 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 do cool things like that. Um, you know, you know I, didn't, like, I didn't even get to touch on those. Yeah, well, let's let's talk a little bit about golf because I know that you recently uh, you you've become a golfer. Uh, you post a lot about it on your social media. Uh, you're on Instagram and Twitter for those that are looking to follow someone uh, and see those wonderful thighs that I talked about at the <laughs> top of the top of the show. Um, you know, I, I noticed that you talked about Florida. You're in. Uh, you've got. I say it's the Breck Shea uh, Shoeless Golf Club. You're a member of that team, um, and that the guy won't wear shoes when he golfs because he's a cuckoo, a cuckoo bird. But um, you know, talk to me a little bit about some of your. Your, your hobbies outside you know golf seems to be a new one yeah golf is definitely a new one I kind of picked it up in Vancouver um with actually with Breck Shea uh and I kind of brought it back to New York and and found some good areas to play and growing up on Long Island I got to um this all like during the last year of COVID I got to play uh Beth Page Black which was really cool you know that's actually like right next to Hicksville um, so it's like a big state park that has a bunch of courses, but obviously being able to play on black is, is pretty cool. Cause they have all those PJ tour events there. And then there's a big, um, there's a big club that me and Connor Lade got to play at uh, a couple of years ago, winged foot, which held the U S open. Yep, yep. Um, we got to play at that through a charity event with Red Bull. And that was a lot of fun as well. And then, yeah, you, you touched a little bit upon uh, my Jim Nance imp impression at the FedEx, the FedEx cup at Liberty national. Um, yeah, and I, I, I enjoy that. You know, I think um, when, when I'm able to be myself and kind of like have a little bit of free reigns and what I'm allowed to do, like when I'm off the field, um, I enjoy creating the con like content like that for the team. You know, I think it was a really cool opportunity where they kind of came to me and they're like, Tim, look, we know you like golf. We got a ticket to the FedEx, like the FedEx Cup at Liberty National. Do you want to go? But like, we have to mic you up and follow you with camera. And I was like, uh, yeah, I want to go. And yeah, this is going to be great. Like, <laughs> I'm going to run with like, I'm going to run with this for sure. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Um, and now that I'm in Houston, uh, I mean, obviously, the, the heat might keep me from golfing a little bit in the afternoons, but I'll, I'll find my time for sure. Oh, yeah. Houston's like the home of the most like, golf tournaments for charity, like in the world, because it's, you can golf almost all year round here. So you'll, You'll be fine as long as, like you said, you stay out of the prime time heat, uh, yeah. especially right before a game. But, um, well, no, that that's uh, that's awesome. The last thing I, I really want to touch on is, uh, well, I kind of want to talk about, you know, as a center back, you don't really get a lot of those opportunities at the forwards and the, uh, you know, you can't even really say no um, when the team comes to you and asks. But I feel like, you know, you're you're getting a lot more stuff 
Um, do you think that's just your willingness to maybe it goes back to your networking or just your ability to, to relate to people? Yeah, I, I just enjoy it. Like, I don't have a problem kind of when when teams come reaching out to me to do like do something off the field, you know, uh, I don't want to say like I live a boring life, but I enjoy doing it. And it's not like I go home and have like a thousand things planned to do. You know, I mean, I have a bulldog that will walk with me for like five minutes before he gets annoyed and wants to turn around. So like my, my, my afternoons aren't really too, too uh, occupied. So I, I enjoy when I get to do stuff off the field. Okay. Well, I know, I know that from your Instagram, it looks like you're quite the, uh, quite the traveler in the off season. Um, you know, what, what, what trips do you have coming up? And the only reason I'm always fascinated by guys that travel, um, you know, I encourage guys to travel. I think soccer is the greatest sport in the world because you meet guys from all over the world and it gives you a chance to see uh, different perspectives that maybe other athletes in this country and other people don't get to see. Um, you know, talk to me a little bit about your traveling experiences. And, and you know, if you have, I know the season just started, so you probably don't have any time to plan anything. But, um, you know, what do you have? Uh, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, my... my... Pre, my pre-COVID trip was going to be, um, I mean, I was talking about it. I went to uh, Barcelona two years ago. And after Barcelona, I or I went to Spain and kind of bounced around Spain a little bit. But after Spain, I was like, oh, I'm going to go to, like, I want to go to South America. Like, and I wanted to bounce around South America a little bit. or like, And then I was like bouncing the idea of going to Australia or going to New Zealand. Because I had a couple of buddies that I played with in Vancouver that live out there. So I thought that that could have been an interesting um, idea to do. But then I also had some teammates from Vancouver that lived in South America. So that was like two ideas that I really, really wanted to do. But then obviously COVID hit and it kind of put a damper on my plans. But uh, those two trips are definitely something that I want to do sooner rather than later. Well, that's awesome. No, I, and I really just highlight that to, to remind people you're, uh, you're out there in the social media world and, and, uh, and you're active. And I, I think that's important. Uh, for people that are, you know, trying to see what, you know, you're real, right? And some of these guys, uh, they're on, they have accounts, they don't tweet, they don't post anything. Uh, you know, I like, I like the, the authenticity of, of what you do. And, um, you know, I'm just a big fan and I, and I wish you nothing but luck. I appreciate you coming on this show. Um, I'm hoping that we've talked the, the Dynamo turnaround into existence. I'm hoping we've talked the U.S. national team into existence. Um, but really, I just appreciate your time. I know that uh, those of MLS appreciate what you do on the field. Hopefully they appreciate what you do off it as well. Yeah, no, Bobby, I appreciate uh, obviously coming on. It's great to chat with you. And then, yeah, I'm hoping for both of those things, the Dynamo turnaround, and uh, hopefully I get back into the men's national team lineup. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, one of my favorite defenders to watch. Hopefully he's one of yours too, Tim Parker. We appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.